Morning, everybody. Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. David and I are so glad you could spend a little part of your weekend with us. And it's uh, it's going to be an okay weekend. I think we've got some rain, but we've had this gorgeous weather all week, haven't we? Oh, we sure have. I, I know it's like um, Adam on his Facebook was saying, oh, plan your outdoor activities for you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I said back, I said, well, could we plan the weather around my schedule? That's right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, I tell you, the coolness that we've had this week uh, reminds us that, that fall is on its way, and one of the great things about fall is to be able to enjoy some cool season vegetables at, fresh out of your garden. So today, we're going to help you achieve that. Yeah, exactly. I think what happens a lot of times, you know, we're so busy in the summer, you know, getting kids off to school, mm -hmm. getting that last little vacation time in, and, and a lot of times it's just too hot and uncomfortable to be outside. But a lot of times we overlook the opportunity to grow fall vegetables. And quite honestly, there are actually more options. You have more choices mm -hmm. of vegetables in the fall season than you do in the summertime. Now, Chris, when I say summer vegetables, you know, everybody loves cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers and squash and corn, and these are all the vegetables that thrive in the heat of summer, but there's all kinds of things like broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, Swiss chard, spinach, mm -hmm. and all the ones we'll be going through today that we actually start planting now in late summer because what we're looking forward to is harvest as we go into of uh, October, November, December right. time period. So we can really extend the vegetable season. They're healthy, they're mm -hmm. nutritious, they're delicious. And you don't have to have a big garden to, to enjoy them either. No, and we'll go mm -hmm. through all this today, you know, whether you're growing little small containers mm -hmm. or big large gardens or anything in between. So stay tuned today. We, we, we're going to take the whole show. Actually, Diane is still out, so we're not taking phone calls, and so we, we have a lot to talk about today. Yeah, sure so. do. So a couple quick announcements. Uh, just wanted to let you know if you if you I know you're watching on uh, not on Direct TV, but if you have friends or neighbors that have Direct TV and have not been able to see the show, we're on Direct TV now. News Channel 8 is on Direct TV. So please spread the word. We'd love to to have them join us every Saturday. Uh, and again, if you if you miss an episode episode or want to go back and double check. Now, what did David say about this or what did Peggy say about that? On our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com, you'll find past episodes uh, along with the outlines. Yeah, and we put the outlines, so mm -hmm. sometimes we're talking about specific plants and plant names. You can always look it up there. Absolutely, absolutely. And our seminars are going to be starting up. We, are, we just finished up the seminar schedule. It's at the printer now, so it's going to be sent out in the next couple of weeks. They start on September 7th. A great selection of seminars, as always. I think you're, you're starting us off uh, at one of the locations, right? Yeah, I'll be out in Gainesville on September 7th. Myself and Renata, who may, if you know, talking about lawn alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about lawns a lot, I do, but we're also going to talk about some of the other options that you have. Great, great. But there's cooking classes, demonstrations, some of the uh, plant societies like the Rose Show and Chrysanthemum Show, all kinds of neat stuff. And we will be sending out e-blasts about it as it gets closer. So if you're not on our email mailing list, go to our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com, and sign up for that as well. Uh, and our, and our uh, regular mail, but it may be, I think we've got everybody situated for the regular mail one that will go out this time. So at least sign up for the uh, email list. So we send the e-blasts out usually every couple weeks, every other week. So and that, those are full of great information, sometimes some specials, and some si some, sometimes something fun to do. Yeah. So, okay, well that's all the seminars I have, I mean all the s announcements I have. Good. Well, we're, like I said, we're going to be talking about cool season vegetables throughout most of the program, but I want to take a minute to talk about another important cool season crop, if mm -hmm. I can use that word, mm -hmm. and, and that would be our lawns. <laughs> uh, most of us are growing cool season grasses, which means that they thrive during those temperatures of 60 and 70 degrees and the moist conditions, right. the same as many of the vegetables we'll talk about. But there are a couple things that you might be wanting to tend to in your lawn, and I'll kick this off with a couple pictures. So this first picture that we're looking at uh, is not a thing of beauty. No. No. This no, is, no. This is um, what we want to avoid encountering. Right. <laughs> um, I actually, I took this picture last September uh, to give you sort of a time reference. It's in there. And what I really want to alert people to is that this is the time of year that grubs become active. Uh, if you take a look at this life cycle chart that I have brought in here, this shows basically what happens. The grubs are, or the beetles, the adult beetles, the Japanese beetles, mass chafers, green june bugs, um, this whole complex, 
they're out above ground actively feeding during late June, July, um, becoming a pest out in the garden. That's when they're visible to us. But at that time, they're also mating and they do their egg laying in sort of that uh, end of July time period. Uh, so those eggs are hatching now as we go into August. And if you can see what happens, the grubs hatch out and they start chewing and doing their damage as we go into August, September, early October time period. So I'm just saying that um, this is a time to be monitoring, to be watching. If you start to observe, if you start to see patches of your lawn turning brown, like they're beginning to die out, that's getting ahead, that's gonna be our weed talk there. But if you start to see areas of your grass that are browning and dying out, then what you need to do is actually dig into the grass, lift that up, mm -hmm. and observe below ground. Uh, they'll be in that top one or two inches. So you actually lift that up and see if that's what's causing the problem. And you've brought a product to show us here. Right. We've got on the set here. If we could take a look at that. Right. There we go. Now, well, it's if, hard to see, but. <laughs> let me see if I can straighten that out a little bit. If you were to encounter a grub problem, and again, this is saying if necessary, ooh, which way am I going? No, this there way. There we go. <laughs> then what we want you to do is go out and apply some of this 24-hour grub killer. Uh, you put that down. You can see a little image there of the grubs in here. You apply that. It's a granular over your lawn, water it in really well, kills the grubs instantly, and that problem's gone. So that's one thing to be looking for. Now the other we want to talk about real quickly are if you have weeds in your lawn. Mm -hmm. And that's that picture of that ugly lawn. Which so many of us do. Right. <laughs> well, that um, what happens, you know, the, uh, during the course of the summer, of mm -hmm. course, there's all kinds of weeds, and we'll see them in this picture here. Uh, you know, start popping up. There's some crabgrass oh, in there, some in there. clover, <laughs> exactly, a little spurge. So these weeds start showing up in your garden or in your lawn. If that problem is bad, if you have a lot of weeds in there, this is a good time to go out and kill them off uh, because you would go out, and I brought as an example, this Trimec crabgrass plus lawn weed killer. This stuff kills the weeds, kills the crabgrass, but does not harm your lawn. And what I'm bringing this up about is there's a four week waiting time between when you apply this and when you can do your seeding. So looking ahead, if we say, okay, the best time to be seeding your lawn is gonna be September, early October, and you have a weed problem, let's go out now, kill those weeds off, so that come September, you'll be in a good position to go in and do your fall seeding and fertilizing. Great, okay. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll get to our fall vegetables. Yum, yum. We're talking about fall or cool season vegetables today. I mean, there's nothing quite like being able to go in your in your yard or out beside your kitchen door and pick something fresh and use in your in your cooking. Oh, it is. I mean, it's it's just so rewarding. Mm -hmm. So even if you're just doing a, a little few vegetables right. and herbs to supplement your meal, or you have the time and the opportunity to do a big full scale garden, it's it's very very rewarding. Thing is, I know it's not like you talk about fall vegetables, mm -hmm. but it's August time right. period, <laughs> right? But the thing is that we're always talking about on this show is to get the results that you want to achieve. Those results it requires that you plan ahead. So we're talking about a group of vegetables and herbs and bulbs that we're we'll be discussing today that really thrive at about an average temperature of sort of 50 to 70 degrees. So conditions like we're having right now, warm days, cool nights, mm -hmm. that's the ideal growing condition. So even though it's August and it's still summertime, we need to be getting started now so that be prepared. the plants are there mm -hmm. and prepared and ready for your harvest as we go into the fall right. season. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting time of year where the summer season's still there. You, know, you still got tomatoes coming in and peppers coming right. in. But I'm saying, hey, you also mm -hmm. need to be thinking about what you want to be putting kind of in as you go into time. the fall. 
So like we had mentioned earlier, there's a huge selection of vegetables that thrive during this cool well, weather. Well, you were just pointing out, he's got a list here that is twice as long on the, on the fall vegetable part as the summer vegetable part. Yeah. And I would have thought opposite. <laughs> exactly, but we overlook this and that's right. some neat things where we live where we've got, you know, we can get a cool season harvest in spring, mm -hmm. we get the warm season vegetables in summer, and then we've got another season coming up right here. So I'll start with again a couple pictures okay. to give you an example. These are the kind of things that you can be growing. Uh, so when we talk about the fall vegetables or cool season vegetables, uh, in this picture, I think in the foreground, it looks like we've got a little bit of cabbage going on in there. Uh, just behind, no, those oh, are Brussels actually sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. Oh, we well, got Brussels sprouts, yeah. cabbage, you got a little bit of everything. I know, in there. and that's yeah. my own garden. I just can't. <laughs> <Okay. work. laughs> that's in the old days when I had a big garden. I was going to say, that looks like an awfully now. big garden for your That's house, before Steve. I moved into the townhouse. Um, used to have 90 acres, oh, and that's wow. what I spent my time right. doing. Um, but this is the kind of stuff, I mean, Brussels sprouts, I know they get a bad reputation, but that's like one of my favorite of the cool mm -hmm. season vegetables. I tend to love the bitterness of, of the Brussels sprouts that are in there. Right behind it, looks like there's cauliflower planted in there. Behind that, we've got, you know, broccoli. These are all members of the mustard family. They're a lot of times what we refer to as coal crops. They all grow under the same kind of conditions. Uh, and I was just reading the other day, I was surprised to find out these are all very high in vitamin C. Mm. And you don't, believe you don't or not, think about that, right? At least I didn't go into the details, but the article is saying that they have more protein than you get in milk. Really? Yeah. Wow. So these things are delicious, they're mm. versatile, and they're healthy for you. Great. Uh, we're also talking about different greens, uh, things like kale, Swiss chard, spinach, lettuce. Uh, these also thrive during the cool temperatures uh, and can be planted now as we go into that uh, extended season of fall. I'm hearing too that kale is now the big, in, in Hollywood, that's the, the big yeah, stars. I see people are, are juicing, juicing it and it. stuff yeah, now. That's guys, the big thing. Me, I just steam it, but mm -hmm. you know, hey, I'm sure there's a million <laughs> different ways to use it. I'm not that versatile or adventurous right. in the kitchen, but <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of good uses for these. And root crops also, uh, we start talking about things like uh, radishes and carrots where that root and that tuber develops during the cool weather also. Uh, bulbs, again we don't think of this necessarily as traditional vegetables, but you know garlic, onions, oh, right. leeks, mm -hmm. I mean again this is the time to be planting all that stuff. So the real issue to me comes in, well, okay, you know, I got my tomatoes and my peppers and my corn out there, but I'm also saying I want to get started on these. So what we do is just sort of intersperse our plantings. Uh, and this picture up here is a, a vegetable garden. It's set as a demonstration garden out at Green Spring Gardens Park. Mm -hmm. And this is really, I think, how we're going to manage this if you're on limited space. Right. Um, I said, well, in a big garden, I can always just turn up a new bed, and that was no problem. But when you're limited on space, what happens, you can see here where there's cucumbers growing up with the trellis. Uh, there's zucchini squash growing in the background. But what will happen is in between harvests, let's say you just harvested beans out of that area, now you can take and rotate a crop of radishes in, which is what they're doing here. Or if I, once my cucumbers are harvested and they're gone and you tear them out and then you rotate in and maybe that's where you decide to plant garlic. So kind of doing the same thing that the farmers always did in the large scale on a small scale as well. Exactly. So I know you're limited on space but you kind of start to rotate these in wherever you have the space available. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I think in our next picture Got some Swiss chard coming up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Showing here again another example at Swiss chard, how that's just interplanned in there and kind of filling the gaps in wherever uh, we mm -hmm. find the space that's there. And you've got kind of a family grouping type of thing here, right? Right. Now, all these greens, they're all in the um, spinach family, mm -hmm. spinach, Swiss chard, beets. Um, again, nice greens because we just talked about some of the plants that are in the mustard family, the coal crops. Uh, but these are also, like I said, members of the beet family. And they all do great at this time of year. Uh, now, the other thing that we're going to do is we extend our season. Uh, we are interplanting these into the different areas of the garden, rotating crops through. But here you can see lettuce. It's planted in a raised bed. 
those hoops are there because even as we go later into the year, as we start going into the cold weather, November, December, even January, they'll be able to put uh, plastic over top right. of this, essentially create a cold frame in there so that we extend our season out there. So what we're trying to do is really what we call intensive gardening techniques. I say intensive because we're rotating and trying to get like three different crops out of that same piece of ground in the year. Uh, we're trying to use every square inch of it that's in there. We're extending our season by putting these different cold frames and protections out there. So if we're going to get this kind of productivity out of our garden and get that kind of harvest out of our garden, that means we're going to have to put more input into it. We're going to have to be more aggressive in how we maintain the fertility how we maintain the soil, closer attention to our watering, because we're really trying to maximize every bit of production we can out of every little square foot of it. So a little bit of pre-thinking and planning can get you the best results. Absolutely, and that's what I would say. When we come back, I'm going to go in a lot more detail on how we're going to manage the soil uh, to really get the most out of that little bit of space. Great. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. We're so glad you could join us today. We are talking about growing cool season vegetables, and David has some charts and some great information <clears throat> to show you. So he's over at our virtual garden, and uh, he's got some great info, info for you. All right, thanks, Debbie. Uh, we've been talking about the different vegetables that you can grow, planting now, and preparing for fall harvest. But we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk more about soil during this segment. Because, uh, as, as all of you know, uh, if you're going to have healthy, productive gardens, you need to have a healthy, productive soil. There's just no way around that. So I'm always telling people every bit of time, effort, and energy that you could put into improving the soil is going to reward you in terms of productivity and the rewards that come back. So one of the things that happens, of course, is our soil tends to be predominantly made up of clay. If you look at a soil, basically it has three different components in there. And those would be essentially the sand, silt, and clay. So what I've done in my little chart here is the three different components. They're really based on the size of the particle. So if you look down here at a clay particle, clay particle is the smallest and finest of all the soil particles. And you can see what happens. It's just very highly eroded stone. So we start out with big rocks. You know, the rocks get eroded down the gravel, the gravel breaks down the sand, the sand breaks down the silt, the silt breaks down the clay, and that end product, you, these things are so small that you need an electron microscope to see them. So in our region here, we're in a very, very old geological area, so it's very old, very highly eroded soils with lots of clay in it, and these clay particles just sort of stack on top of each other like this, all these tiny little particles. Now the good news is clay tends to be very high in fertility, high moisture holding capacity, but the bad news is it gets so dense, so compact, that then it's difficult for air and water to infiltrate into it. So that brings us to our next topic, which is the soil structure. So what we can do if we sit around and we say, oh my, you know, I got too much clay and that clay is so dense and it's hard as a rock and the air and water can't get in there and the air and water doesn't get in so the roots don't get in. So what our real goal here is that we want to improve the soil structure. How are those clay particles arranged? Rather than them just being compressed and flattened down, our goal, what we really want, see I'm not used to the screen still, there's this granular structure. The granular structure means that these clay particles are gathered together in like little crumbs. And when they're like this, when they have this granular structure, this allows the water to infiltrate through. And as you can see in this little chart, it also drains out of it. So this is the ideal. That's where we would like to get to. So there's these others. We talk about prismatic, blocky, you know, the single grain. You know, these are, you know, stuff soil scientists go into. But just keep in mind, this is where we want to be, where we've got that nice balance of air and water infiltration, enough clay to hold nutrients, and this is going to give us good results. So how do we get here? from where we are to this. Well, the real answer to this, the solution to improving your soil is with compost. 
uh, as we start to mix and incorporate compost into the soil, that organic matter and all the bacteria and the fungi that are in there go to work breaking it down. And these bacteria and the fungi that are in there, they take these clay particles, these little microscopic, sub-microscopic particles, and they start to glue them together. The slime from the bacteria, the hyphae from the fungi, they pull them together and start to glue them into these granules. And that's what gives us that nice structure that we're looking for. So what we're trying to do is always encourage composting. Uh, essentially, we're, we're pulling vegetables out of the garden, taking this material, throw it in, letting the bacteria and fungi go to work, and then come out with the finished product that we cycle back into our garden. So if we're composting, the basic ingredients that we're looking for uh, is putting things like grass clippings, leaves, straw, kitchen scraps, coffee grounds. You could even use shredded newspaper. Ideally, you want about one part green material, one part brown material, because these brown materials like leaves and straw are providing the, car the carbon of, that the microbes need, but they also need nitrogen that they're getting from the green material, which could be things like the grass clippings, the kitchen scraps. Coffee grounds, oddly enough, are pretty high in nitrogen. The things that we don't put into the compost, my do not list, is we don't want to be putting meat, fat, animal waste, you know, invasive weedy plants, diseased plants in there. Because if we put this material in there, it can attract unwanted visitors, you know, things like, you know, rats and wildlife are attracted to these things. Also, our most of us, our compost really doesn't get high enough temperature to kill off the weed seeds and the diseased plants. It needs to get 120 degrees or hotter for that to happen. So let's just be on the safe side and keep that stuff out of there as well. So we mix these things together, one part green, one part brown, and we turn that back into the garden, uh, just till it back in there, and that really builds the structure. Now, there's a million different ways to do this. Uh, there's also a lot of sometimes, one is known by some people as lasagna gardening. This is where the composting is done in place. Again, here that, that material, rather than putting it in a bin and turning it and monitoring it, it's just layered on the ground. These beds are built up, and then it takes a little time, but over a period of two or three years, this turns into really nice, good, rich soil. I've had uh, some of my friends do this. I haven't personally, but they'll just, they're creating a new garden bed. They don't have the means to cultivate the heavy soil. They'll put a layer of newspaper down, build layers of compost on top of that. And like I said, it might be a two year process, but then they've had some phenomenal results when they go back to plant and establish those beds. So that might also be another way that you consider doing it. Now, if you don't have the means uh, or the time to go out and actually do your own composting. Of course, that's where Maryfield Garden Center steps in because we sell lots of different kinds of compost. Uh, we have everything from, you can see, composted lobster shells, composted from the mushroom farms, composted leaves and grass clippings, composted manure, you know, blended compost. The list goes on and on and on. What we have put forward is this we're calling a strive for five idea that if you mix different sources of compost in there that gives you a broader range of nutrients, more diversity in terms of bacteria and fungi, and ultimately better results that are in there. This kind of came out of the square foot gardening concept where they're trying to get you to, to blend and mix different types of compost together. And I think that makes good sense in really any kind of gardening. So my bot thing is get some compost in there. I don't care if it's your stuff that you produce in your backyard or if you have a favorite like, you know, the leaf grow or the lobster compost, the mushroom compost. It's all good. It's all going to add to your soil and the more diversity you can get in there, different types, probably the better off you're going to be. So we have to do this because we're really trying to get the productivity and maximize those opportunities out of our garden. Now, another way that we can do this, um, again, if you have the space and the resources, this is what's sometimes called green manure. Uh, this is taking plants and tilling those plants back into the garden. So here, this is a, a plant it's called hairy vetch. A lot of work was done with this at USDA. So in this case, you know, I planted the hairy vetch, allow it to grow up. It's a legume, so it's fixing nitrogen out of the atmosphere. It's got, so it's high in nitrogen. 
I let this grow, I till it back into the soil, the bacteria and the fungi break it down, decompose, and cycle those nutrients back to the plant. So this is one that works pretty well during um, cool weather. Uh, sometimes one of my favorites is in summertime, if I had time in between crops, I could use buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat grows, these are plants they produce we call lots of biomass, lots of vegetation in a short period of time. So again, this gets cultivated and turned back into the soil. Uh, the garden center, I mean, we have things like clover, we've got annual rye, we've got winter rye, uh, we have any number of these. So there's different ways to do this, but the bottom line is we need to keep replenishing the organic matter in the soil, keep building that structure, uh, maximize our productivity so that we can get the most as far as our harvest out there. So we got to take a little break right now, but when we come back, we're going to continue talking a little bit about fall vegetables. We've talked about the type of plants there are, we've talked about the soil structure that you either need or need to create, and now let's talk a little bit about design. Yeah, and again, this, this is unlimited. Right. You know, the amazing things I see people come up with as far as their garden mm -hmm. designs go. <laughs> Uh, but again, we'll just start with a couple pictures. Okay. You know, I, I'd shown you sort of more traditional gardens right. before, you know, where they had a big area where you could till it up and, you know, planting stuff in rows. Uh, if you can do raised beds, that's, I'm just envious. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of advantages to doing raised beds. Uh, we talked about the difficulty of getting that soil structure in a lot of places. So where you can't go down, let's go, go up. Go up, there you uh, go. Also, you know, as uh, the years go by, you know, that the ground seems to be getting further and further away. So, <laughs> you know, having that up so you don't have to stoop over as much, you know, makes it a very comfortable, Absolutely. nice way to garden that's in there. So, uh, again, this is a, a beautiful garden. You know, Renetta, who many of you know, this was a garden that she had worked at and developed. And, oh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice. You can see a mix of all the different coal crops in the background there, you know, with um, overlapping some of the summers. So again, these, these things, that's why you see the warm season and the cool season crops overlapping, uh, always planning for what's next. So that's great if you have the means. Uh, now, kind of what I'm doing now is I'm, a, you know, like I say, I'm a townhouse gardener now. Got a whole different ball game. <laughs> happy to be downsizing. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, different, different times different of life. Mm -hmm. uh, this just going on in one pot. That's uh, wonderful. And obviously you're not going to feed a family of six out of there or something, but you know, a lot of times just the joy of being able to supplement Mm -hmm. You know, like some of your cooking by going out and clipping some fresh parsley, or even if you only end up with one or two heads of cabbage that you can serve through the year. I mean, uh, and that's beautiful too. It is, and it's convenient because you can move that around if you need to. You exactly. Know, and keep you're having it right a party or something, and you want to move it out, away, out of the way. There you go. Exactly. In old days, I had to, you know, walk. It seemed like a quarter mile right. to get to the garden. <laughs> Here, you just step right outside the door. Well, and then there's even more innovative ways. Uh, what this is, is a vertical garden. This is garden. very cool. Exactly. Stephanie and out in our annual section put this together, basically just took an old pallet, mm -hmm. you know, I'm oversimplifying, but filled with soil, stuck the plants in, and this is hanging up growing vertically. So don't, don't talk about limited space, you know, oh, we only have a balcony or something like that. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can get vegetables growing in your garden. Mm -hmm. So. How do we get going on these? Um, this is broccoli, obviously. Uh, in this, what we're doing is we're actually consuming the flower head. Uh, so as the days get short, the temperatures get cool, this goes into its flowering stage. But our idea is that we want to harvest broccoli when those buds are tight and dense before they've actually opened up and started to bloom. Uh, very closely related to it, similar would be cauliflower. Uh, cauliflower, again, you can see we're eating the um, the flower head that's on there. Right. And then of course cabbage, which we've talked about. And what I'm trying to say is all of these are closely related. They're anything that forms a head. Those plants take some time to develop uh, because we want to allow that head to develop and uh, get it before it um, actually harvests. So if you're growing any of these vegetables that form that head, that's where I'm gonna say you really wanna come in and buy some transplants. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just brought examples. So you've got broccoli and uh, Brussels, Brussels sprouts. sprouts. Mm -hmm. So Brussels sprouts, for example, 
Uh, it's, you know, those little heads develop all along the stem. They take weeks and weeks and weeks. So if you're growing from seed, let's say you planted seed and I went out now in the middle of August, they may not be ready to harvest until December if you're lucky. Right. So these plants, I'm really suggesting you come into the garden center, pick up some of these transplants, they're going to give you at least a good six week, eight week head start on things. Mm -hmm. You plant them now and then you go in to harvest later. That's great. Okay. Now this is an also an excellent time to be growing greens. And this could be any number of things. You know, this could be, you know, things like Swiss chard, uh, lettuce, the list goes on. I think I got a picture to start this off with. Let's see, yeah, let's yeah. go. So if we can switch to our picture, mm -hmm. basically what I'm trying to say is if you want to put those greens like kale and Swiss chard out there, you can, um, there they are, that's my new garden. All right. Uh, <laughs> growing in an earth box. Mm -hmm. uh, just again, they're so beautiful and again, you, you can grow them in areas large or small, but this is a good time to be planting those. And again, we do sell the transplants uh, if you want to do it like that. I'm just pulling a couple of these rounds as examples. Um, but things like the Swiss chard, the kale. These are really uh, beautiful as, as plants too. I love these. Lettuce <coughs> is one of the easiest the things in the world to grow. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy and convenient to come in and buy transplants on these. But let me say, these greens, you can also easily grow from seed. Uh, so. These grow so quickly that if you want to grow any of these things, feel free to come in and mm -hmm. also you can plant these from seed and you've got enough time to do that because they'll be ready for harvest sometime in as quick as, you know, like six, eight, ten the weeks. The leafy ones. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And it's nice to do multiple plantings, not do everything at once, but spread this out time so that your harvest is also spread right. out of time. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can go from transplants, we can go from seeds if you're growing greens, and then of course they're well, I say, of course, people may not realize it, but there are actually bulbs that you can be planting right now. And when I'm saying bulbs, this is a great time of year to be planting garlic. Uh, you see garlic growing up in the garden there. So you plant it now. It grows as a little green basically through the, uh, through the fall and the winter months. And then when it reaches the flowering stage, you cut those blossoms off. Uh, and then you harvest the bulbs next summer. So if you're planting now, your harvest would be coming next summer. Mm -hmm. We got one um, more picture to show, I think. Yeah, I think this is also showing onions. I was getting a little, I, I love growing garlic, so I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, but you can also plant onion sets. Uh, you plant them now, but you probably won't be harvesting till next spring. So this picture is actually probably taken in March or April, but you can plant now. Or, of course, you can get a head start on that by coming in to pick up these little starter plants. The other bulb that I wanted to talk about uh, quickly, because I know I'm going over on time, but I absolutely have to talk a little bit about these autumn crocus. Mm, okay. And I say that exactly. because, you know, who would be thinking of crocus, <laughs> you know, as I'm talking about the vegetables? I, I was going to say. <laughs> well, we do have these saffron crocus. Ah. And so, of course, with these, you plant them now. They actually will bloom this fall. Mm -hmm. And the saffron crocus, of course, this is tedious, but you'll go out with tweezers, harvest the anthers off of that, and use that as a seasoning in your cooking. Really? Yes. Wow. So all this gets planted now. Some of you harvest this year. Some of you harvest next spring. Mm -hmm. Some of you harvest <coughs> next, next summer. Onion sets as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Take a quick break and we've got more information for you. Stay tuned. Well, as with any gardening, uh, vegetable gardening is the same. There's some things you have to look out for. There are. Uh, quite honestly, vegetable gardening is high maintenance. Mm. Um, I know that's not what everybody <laughs> wants to hear. You know, everybody wants to say, oh, it was, everything's so easy and stuff. But you know what? Right. In my, my view, world view, anything worth doing, you know, requires Absolutely. effort, and that's what brings the value to mm -hmm. it. So, uh, I mean, you've and already it's seen. Fun. Yeah, oh, Garden it is. is fun. It's <laughs> phenomenal. It's, it's great, but I mean, it's, you know, it's not easy. Right. I'm not trying to pretend that it is. <laughs> you know, this effort we talk about in putting this, preparing the soil, you know, the planting that goes into it. Called um, exercise. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's time. But that's also why it takes so much pride. Right. 
and what you what you produce in mm -hmm. the end of it because it's you know it takes a little effort to get there right um, so kind of with that lead in we're going to talk a little bit about some of the maintenance and the management that goes into it and anybody that's a vegetable gardener uh, probably already knows this probably the number one chore the most annoying chore is going to be weeding mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know that there's really a super easy answer to that uh, I think you can do a lot to reduce the weeding that goes into it now this is obviously a very clean picture right. not a weed in the <laughs> garden uh, that's because somebody is maintaining it that way mm -hmm. um, it's not just going to stay that way on its own so uh, essentially you know you're going to be doing some hand weeding uh, up close to the plants you know pulling the stuff out where you're just not uh, there's just no other way to do it uh, but the most effective thing I think the singular best way is to prevent the weeds with a good layer of mulch now you can use before this is we're getting ahead of ourselves now before you um there we go yeah mm -hmm. the thing to do is like i said preventing these things there's all different ways and different types of mulch that you can use but essentially if you have exposed soil something's going to grow there right so we want to cover <laughs> and protect the soil protect it not only from weeds getting started protect it from erosion uh protect it from the impact of the raindrops that are on there with vegetable gardens, because we're constantly going in there rotating crops and changing things around, uh, a lot of times straw makes a very nice mulch in right. there. Mm -hmm. It's effective, it's inexpensive, it's easy to use. And what I found works really great is after I've turned up a new area, I put a layer of newsprint down, just regular newspaper, one, maybe two layers thick, put a couple, three inches of straw on top of it. That will prevent weeds for about a year. Wow, that's great. Uh, and it's cheap, it's easy, it's mm -hmm. economical, so that if you go back in there to turn that bed up, you can just turn all that back into the soil and you haven't invested a whole lot. Now that I'm gardening on a smaller scale, quite honestly, I use the Virginia Fines pine bark mulch because I think it's prettier and it matches it with the rest of my landscape, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's small enough scale. I'm, I'm happy, to, you know, with the uh, don't mind the expense or cost of it. Right. So you'll see people using pine straw, you know, regular wheat straw like this bark mulch compost the list goes on sky's so, the limit yeah weeds basically I stay ahead of it with hand weeding combined with good mulching mm -hmm. practices sounds good now, now obviously vegetables are out there everybody wants, wants to, to eat, eat your vegetables including the bugs right not just you <laughs> uh, and the major major pest um, with these different coal crops the cabbage broccoli you know the uh, plants that we're growing is what's called a cabbage worm uh, what happens, the adult is a moth, that's a little insect in there, or a butterfly. A little butterfly, and you'll see them flying around, oh, aren't they pretty, but what they're doing is they're laying eggs. Ah. The, um, the egg hatches, and then, of course, the little caterpillar starts chewing away, and if you start to see your crops riddled with little holes in there, then that's probably, you'll find this green worm in there, that's a cabbage worm. Uh, again, but you have a cure. Oh, we do. It's pretty easy to manage. Uh, we've got some really effective non-toxic organic controls. Again, this Captain Jack's dead bug. I go to that all the time because it does a really good job controlling a range of insects, does a fantastic job on controlling any of the caterpillars. Uh, and again, it's completely natural, organic, so I feel comfortable recommending for use in the vegetable garden. Great. Mm -hmm. Now another one that you'll run into sometimes if you're growing things like cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, this is really pretty little insect. It's called a harlequin bug, but its mouthpiece is like a little um, syringe, like a little needle. It pokes its mouth into the leaf, sucking sap out of it, and every time it does that, of course, it creates a spot or a blemish and causes the leaf to crinkle up. Uh, the Captain Jacks is really not quite as effective on this. So one of the other pest control techniques that I'm a big, big fan of are floating row covers. This is just a lightweight spun blanket. You can see it's almost like um, tissue paper. And what I'll do is from the minute I put those plants in, I just put this blanket over it and it creates a physical barrier. And it keeps harlequin bugs, stink bugs, you know the cabbage worms it just forms a barrier so that the insects can't get to it and eliminates the need for spraying 
and I'll leave that on all the way until the plant that needs to be pollinated, then I can lift it off of there. And it's so light, the plant continues to grow. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> you see, I just, the transplants or the seeds in this case are planted there. As they grow, it just lifts the blanket up with mm -hmm. us. And so, of course, we have that available at our garden centers. That's a nice way to control. It's just nothing pretty about it. <laughs> and then maybe our biggest pest of the pests. Ah, yes, the exactly. deer. It's deer, rabbits, hungry. squirrels, <laughs> the wildlife is just really gets discouraging. It does. Uh, it you does. know, you put your time and effort and your maintenance and just when things are about ready to harvest, that's when these Rob guys show up. Rob was just saying that as he went to get something out of our little garden the yeah. other night. <laughs> so here, there's no one answer again. There's going to be a variety of different options that are available to you. You can put um, deer fencing or deer netting up. Uh, and really putting some type of a barrier up really is oftentimes the most effective way to do it. But if you're talking about deer, it needs to be at least seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about jump, things right. like rabbits, you know, it's got to be can, secured to the ground so mm -hmm. they can't scoot under it. And of course, squirrels, you know, that's a whole nother story because they can climb over oh, almost right. anything, so it has to be like completely encased. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of us, netting works. Where netting does not work, then we go towards repellents. And there's a whole host of good repellents that are out there. I want to show one that's called um, deer scram. This is one that's sprinkled around the perimeter of your vegetable garden and the smell of it deters the wildlife. It usually remains effective for about four weeks, you know, between applications. Okay. Uh, another one that more and more people are using is this uh, Sweeney's All Season. Uh, in this case, the repellent is inside a little capsule, so it's sheltered and protected from the weather. Mm. And so it lasts much longer. It costs more, but these, you put these little dispensers out, and they can last anywhere from four, five, six months or more. Oh, so great. this is nice because I don't have to go out and apply it as often. Mm -hmm. So it's a real convenience, but you, you know, it's going to cost great. you a little bit more. It's out there. Okay, we're going to have to take a little break. Okay. And when we come back, I think you have one or two more things to show us. We're going to wrap this. up some things okay. on edibles and then also switch some to some pretty, flowers. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Okay, we'll be right back. Running short on time, there's been so much to talk about, but something else that's very popular is herbs. Right, because we've been talking about the vegetables and mm -hmm. the bulbs and the root crops and everything. Hey, I didn't want to overlook. There's great herbs that you can also mm -hmm. thrive in the cool temperatures, and that would be things like parsley and cilantro. Uh, to me, I think it's almost a waste of time trying to go cilantro in the heat of summer. Right. Uh, what will happen, a lot of these plants that we're talking about, they require the cool temperatures. When it's hot, when it goes to like 80 degrees, 90 degrees, what happens is they bolt. They go into a flowering stage. Right. So, for example, cilantro is just a classic. It's so frustrating because we're growing it for the greens. Mm -hmm. We want the uh, lovely pungent greens that are in there. But if the temperatures are hot, it suddenly jumps into its flowering stage. Mm -hmm. So cilantro, um, along with parsley, you plant now as the temperatures are cooling off. That gives you the nice... Uh, succulent greens that are in there. Uh, you can buy the plants that are showing. This stuff is easy to grow from seed. And if I had the space, you know, I would be planting cilantro like every two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So I just have a succession of continuing harvest right. all through the cool weather. Okay. Of course, pars parsley will even make it through the winter and be there for you next spring. All right. So, any other herbs now, that you want to show? We got to move on, okay, Debbie. Let's We're do running some pretty, out of time. Of pretty, course, pretty, there's pretty. many others. We could go on that for another I'll start pulling these whole up here. show. <laughs> but I wanted to go what I'm calling kind of a sneak peek. Mm -hmm. uh, because with flowers, you know, it's like, hey, we still have all these beautiful things blooming in the garden. You know, I don't want to cut their right. life short or anything like that. The only reason I would be putting any cool season annuals in right now would be, hey, some things that might have, you know, Maybe you're way on vacation and you neglected some watering and mm -hmm. you're just ready to freshen it up and replace it. But along with these different vegetables and herbs we're talking about, there's a lot of flowers, um, annuals that just love the cool temperatures. Sweet alyssum, the one we're showing right now, really is one of my favorites. Uh, they just have such a wonderful fragrance mm -hmm. to them. 
Uh, it's a plant that does have a long bloom season. When it gets kind of leggy and it's not as productive, you just get your scissors out, you give it a haircut, and it starts flowering again. Mm -hmm. And it's a lovely little board, border plant, or if you're doing containers, and we talk about thrillers, fillers, spillers, mm -hmm. this is a nice little filler that goes in there. So you can see it's a delicate, small flower. I was flower. just about to say, bright and delicate. Yeah, but again, it's, it's just such a, a charmer that's in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also, oh, what do we want to go, go ahead. You Here, go. I'll go next. Right. <laughs> you go next. This is one that, um, it's not well known to everybody, but it's one that you probably should get to know, and there's more and more varieties coming out. It's got a mouthful of a name, Osteospermin. Uh, what I like to do is I just call it a blue-eyed daisy. It's a little hard to see in there, but you can tell it's got looks just like a daisy, but if you're able to get in there and get a close-up look to it, it'll actually have a little bit of a bluish color in the center okay. of this thing. Again, these thrive during the cool temperatures. You can see there's a variety of colors. These are young. You see sort of that pinkish blue. There's yellow. There's orange. Okay. And we've got it's 30 super, seconds oh, left, I, so I wanted but, to get these in here really quick. snapdragons, <laughs> they need more than 30 seconds. I know, I know. Snap, Look at these are gorgeous. Yeah. Just these gorgeous. These guys, sometimes so they'll bright. survive the winter and carry you all the way mm, through till next spring, like depending on how the weather goes. They yeah. love the cool temperatures. Uh, well, we hope we've given you some great inspiration, not only with the beautiful flowers, but with your vegetables. So thanks so much for joining us next week. Uh, Peggy's going to be here. We're going to be talking about amazing miniature gardens. Amazing and fun miniature gardens, we should say. So we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.